It began without a whole lot of warning. There was a letter and a a phone call, maybe two. And the next thing anyone knew, a couple of fellows from the ministry were standing in front of the Big Narrows Town Council, laying it all out. It was a matter of efficiency. It was a matter of tax saving. It was a matter of being able to do more with less. Angus McLeod heard that, leaned forward, and thumped the council table with both fists. Amalgamation? Bellowed Angus. Well, that shut everyone up. Council room was suddenly, if you will excuse the pun, motionless. (laughs) But if you were going to call a spade a spade, Angus had done it. Amalgamation. Big Narrows, Little Narrows, Upper Contrition, and Big Fish Cove would be merged into the regional municipality of, well, there'd be a plebiscite. They could choose the name themselves. Angus summed that up after the meeting. That's like the hangman offering the convicted a selection of rope. (laughs) The plebiscite was a non-starter. Sure, they could choose anything, but the only anything anyone from any of the four towns had put up with were the names they already had. What is in a name? When it's yours. A lot, apparently. So in the end, there was no plebiscite. The name came down from above, just like everything else. The greater municipality of Glencoe. For crying out loud, snorted Angus, what does Glencoe have to do with anything? In a way, the four neighboring towns had brought it upon themselves. All those years spent trying to outdo each other, and I'm not talking about in the hockey arenas or on the curling rinks. Take Boundary Road, for example. The border between Big and Little Narrows runs right down the center of Boundary Road, which means to follow the letter of the law, each town had responsibility for one side of the road. (laughs) Now, you might think that sensible heads would prevail, and the two towns would come together to work out ways of sharing those responsibilities. There were, after all, plenty to go around. Grading, oiling, snow removal, to mention a few. But you'd be wrong. (laughs) Instead of a route to reconciliation, Boundary Road became just another path to prove that the one town was better than the other. This reached its zenith in the summer of 1964 when, without a nod to their neighbors, the Little Narrows Town Council secretly paid a Halifax contractor to pave their half of Boundary Road. (laughs) Suddenly, driving east into Little Narrows meant you drove in smooth, modern luxury. While driving west into Big Narrows, you bounced through teeth-gritting clouds of dust. Little Narrows had to levy a special tax to pay for the extravagance, but not a soul in town complained. For two years, the folks in Little Narrows danced on the undisputed sunny side of the street. The incident of the asphalt, as it came to be known, was not taken lightly and was, no doubt, the cause of the Great Snow War of 1968, (laughs) which, it is worth mentioning, like the War of 1812, lasted well beyond the year it was named for. (laughs) The Snow War was launched the autumn night the Big Narrows Council, still stinging from the humiliation of the paving, voted to buy a snowblower. (laughs) Exactly. The first shot was fired in January. 
When the snowblower finally arrived, and in a twitchy moment of ill-considered excitement, the driver, well, the entire council was there that night, so it's unfair to single out whoever was driving. In any case, it doesn't matter. The fact is, someone, everyone, whoever was at the controls, decided that it would be funny to blow the snow from their side of Boundary Road <laughs> onto the side belonging to Little Narrows. Now, had the guy who was driving the Little Narrows plow that night turned the other cheek and not plowed the blowing snow plus the snow that rightfully belonged to Little Narrows right back again, <laughs> nothing might have happened. But once indignation raises its self-righteous head, things tend to escalate. And that is how snow clearance in big and little narrows became such a costly line item on each year's budget. <laughs> and how it changed from a civic service to a competitive sport. <laughs> Even today, half a century later, both towns own more equipment than either needs and both scramble to be the first to get their half a boundary road cleared. Now, for the most part, this works out in everyone's favor. The thing is, all four towns grew up fiercely independent and remain resolvedly so. But when the fish plant closed a few years back and people started moving to the city, the tax base could no longer support the way things used to be. In some ways, they knew this was coming. Little Narrows kids already went to the elementary school in Big Fish Cove. All the kids go to the regional high school out by the dump. <laughs> there were the obligatory editorials in the paper, but most folks tried to ignore the impending amalgamation, figured it was just another one of those government schemes that would never come to being. And then the elections landed on them like an anvil. Like an anvil, said Angus, more like a ton of bricks. They had to choose the new amalgamated council. A woman from Big Fish Cove was elected mayor. The meetings of that new amalgamated council were uncomfortable. Uh, sorting everything out was like brokering peace in the Middle East. Should they have one Christmas parade or four? Two fishing derbies or none? And then, one day in September, just like those fellows from the ministry, the diggers and front-end loaders showed up out of nowhere and built a roundabout. out by the highway. <laughs> no one had asked for it, and no one much liked the idea, but everyone was pretty keen to try it out. <laughs> Problem was, no one knew the rules. No one had told any of them that you weren't supposed to pass anyone in a roundabout. <laughs> you have to understand, there are people in those towns who don't get out all that often. Earl de Clote, for instance, has never been to the city. And now, almost overnight, if Earl wanted to get from the Narrows to Big Fish Pond, a trip that had never asked any more of Earl in one left-hand turn, meant he'd have to execute the new roundabout, enter at 6 o'clock, and get off at 9. <laughs> it opened on a Saturday morning at 9 a.m. The minister was there to cut a ribbon, and as soon as that was done, everything pretty much fell apart. <laughs> Just about everyone with a car had shown up. <laughs> and once they got into the roundabout, they all headed for the same place, the inside lane. Because <laughs> it felt safer there. Plus, it gave them a chance to make a few laps, try the thing out, get their money's worth. So almost immediately, the whole thing was filled up. You had your people on the inside happy to be there, and the people on the outside trying to work their way in. Which means pretty much this roundabout was working backwards to the way a roundabout is supposed to work. It was like watching water being sucked down a drain. Which was fine, 
until you added the third variable, the people who had been inside long enough who wanted to get out. And they have never done this before. And the only way they could think of getting out was to build up momentum. And when they did that, everyone else had to. So now you have a roundabout full of terrified people all driving faster and faster and faster and suddenly one of them sees a space and he makes his move. And now everyone has to make a move. And everyone is going so fast that no one can tell the head of the fish from the tail. And to make matters worse, every sign on every exit is pointing to the same place, the greater municipality of Glencoe. Some people didn't get out of there for hours. At four o'clock, some desperate soul began to wave a white t-shirt out their passenger side window. And everyone slowed down and eventually stopped. And they cleared it all out slowly, like, like a parking lot after a baseball game. Even then, over half the folks headed off in the wrong direction. And that was Saturday, Sunday. Oh, Sunday was a whole other thing. On Sunday morning, all the folks who had been there Saturday gathered up on the ridge, all of them with binoculars around their necks. <laughs> all of them waiting to see what would happen when the church crowd hit the roundabout. <laughs> the first to arrive was Robin Townsend, 92 years old. He appeared on the quiet Sunday morning at 20 to 10, coming down Boundary Road, heading towards church at 20 kilometers an hour, which is fast for Robin. When he came to the roundabout entrance, he stopped dead. Even though there wasn't a car in sight, it took him five minutes to ease in. He then made five complete rotations before he exited the way he had entered and headed home. Faced with nearly empty pews three Sundays in a row, the Church of the Redeemer established a roundabout prayer group. The new mayor petitioned the ministry. If we could just put the old town's names up, she said. The man from the ministry explained they couldn't do that. Those towns don't exist anymore, he said. Though there was one thing they could do. They could add the name of their main street to their respective exit. Unfortunately, all four towns' main streets had the same name. <laughs> main Street. <laughs> Angus McLeod had a bright idea. We changed the name of Main Street to Big Narrows, said Angus. The ministry didn't fall for that. It has to have an appellation, said the man from the ministry. It, it has to be a, a street or an avenue or a lane. It's an arrow, said Angus. The name of the street is Big. <laughs> the new mayor called Arnie. She had an idea. They would take the amalgamated budget, divide it the way they used to, and let the old councils run things in their own towns. And they wouldn't tell the province. <laughs> she would continue to front the whole operation to the ministry. <laughs> sort of like the governor general, she said. There wouldn't be as much money as there used to be. But if they agreed on certain economies of scale, the money they saved would be more than enough. What economies of scale, said Angus McLeod, leaning over his coffee mug in the Maple Leaf Cafe, staring at Arnie. Snow removal, said Arnie. 
as so often happens, that which had torn them apart brought them together. Maybe a month passed, maybe two, a number of weeks in any case. And one afternoon, the four old mayors got together and hatched a plan. On a moonless night a week or so later, they all met at Arnie's store. Combine their ages, you had over 300 years. They met out back and climbed into Arnie's truck, a ladder and a box in the back, five kilometers out to the highway and then three to the roundabout. When they got there, they parked on the shoulder and set the ladder up against the first sign. Pass me the screwdriver, said Donnie Morrison, the ex-mayor of Little Narrows as he started up the ladder. The signs they were holding had been painted by an artist in Big Fish Cove, and they looked every bit as real as the official ones they were about to take down. <laughs> Each mayor had a turn on the ladder attaching their own town sign. And when they finished, they stood around while Donnie had a smoke. They're gonna come and they'll take them down, said Hugh McKinnon, ex-mayor of Upper Contrition. They look too good, said Arnie, admiring what they had done. It'll take a, a while before anyone spots them, and by then they'll look even better, all weathered up. And we can tell whoever shows up that someone else approved it. And they'll have to investigate that, and you know what? They'll find better things to do. <laughs> while they stood there, a solitary car came down Boundary Road entered the roundabout, and started circling. <laughs> Why, I think that's Earl de Clute, said Donald. What's he doing out here at this time of the night, said Hugh. I do believe he's practicing, said Arnie. <laughs> and they stood there on the side of the road, and they watched him quietly for a moment for the time it took Donnie to finish his smoke. And then Arnie said, should we show him the way or should we let him figure it out himself? Now that is a very good question, said Hugh. I do believe we should go back to the shop and have a beverage and consider that for a while. <laughs> and he turned and he crunched along the shoulder toward the truck. And Donnie shrugged and bent down and picked up the ladder and the other two followed him. The longer I live, said Arnie, the less things seem to change. Oh, you're talking like an old man, said Hugh. I am an old man, said Arnie. Good thing then, said Donnie, that they're building the new regional hospital. Hope they get it done in time for you. <laughs> and they got into Arnie's pickup and they headed back to town, their red taillights disappearing down Boundary Road as the lights on the back of Earl's Chev continued to describe a slow, <laughs> never-ending circle out where they had left him, neither coming nor going, <laughs> neither arriving nor departing, like time itself like waves on rock beach, around and around and around, he went.